spiders come out of these corners. They're not frightening, but they're unexpected. They shoot along their invisible tightrope like a moving frown. That's what happened then. I suddenly felt spiders all over my body. My skin rippled on me. Noises loomed in my ears. I couldn't move. But I was lifted and carried back into the night, into the drowning whirlpool of the dream. What had happened? My husband had stepped out into the courtyard and a young man had been pushed forward. That's all. Nothing in that to give the universe a shrug. I couldn't even see his face, but something in me fastened him to my dream. You think that's too mystic? Well, a few minutes later, my breakfast came back. Not much mysticism in that. Just a lot of fruit. All night long, the pond creaks in its winter coat. You, can you hear it? No, of course not. It won't do it when you want it to. Then they say it's all my imagination. Who's to say your imagination can't tell the truth? Who's to say? And this. I didn't ask for this. Servants behave oddly. I don't like it. My grandfather, Augustus, ah, Augustus, he was very strict on the servant question. At the first hint of slackness or disobedience, you act. If you don't, you suffer for it in the end. Especially abroad. Politics are dangerous enough without untrustworthy servants. But here, they ask questions, questions. They gaze at you. They seem to listen. But nothing ever gets done. I've dismissed three already. But they all come back. I'm sure they come back. You see, you think there's nobody there. And you can't be sure. Cold out there, it was always too hot. I complained about it. Now I can never get warm enough. Break the ice on the pond, then I'll be able to sleep. Walking along the colonnade early in the morning, have you noticed how, as you walk along beside the arches, your shadow suddenly snaps up at you? on the pillar, then flings itself flat on the pavement again. Up and away, up and away. Even when you run, it keeps up. It never does the wrong thing. I'd never noticed it until that morning. I must have done, but everything normal that happened that day looks abnormal from here. It's so hard to unweave the threads, to work out what was significant from what was simply things being what they were. Everything was out of joint, skewed, just by one degree, but skewed. I remember the day holding its breath, as it does when there's going to be an earthquake, or when some semi-domesticated volcano is going to suffer a bout of cosmic indigestion. It was the dream I had. I'm sure of that. I was half in and half out of it, rocking between dream and reality. But even allowing for that, there was something terribly abnormal, something terribly wrong that happened. And I knew it was going to happen, and I had no reason for knowing, no logic on my side. A dream, that's all. And now I live in an orphanage of dreams. Well, nobody wants to hear someone else's dreams, do they? Fruitless, pointless, like those terrible boars who try to describe in mind-numbing detail some comedy they saw at the theater. <laughs> Probably too early. 
Yes, too early. You'd think this afternoon stretched much further than just from midday to dusk. That one dream, though. It was that one dream that I had to speak of, that I had to act on, and that I shrank from. I made a gesture. No more. What more could I have done? A woman in my position. My mind goes round and round that day like the layers of an onion. Yes, it's a good image. Layers of an onion. I try to find the center now. And I pick and I pick. And as I pick, the tears. Not too early now. What it is to be married to a logical man. He was certainly that. Military training, no doubt. Gather information, weigh up the possibilities, make a decision. Fact plus fact plus fact. It was always his way. And it was the no-nonsense part of me that appealed to him most. So he said. He never discovered the rest of me, but I didn't complain. He wanted that particular governorship, I didn't. But he had powerful friends on his side, and he got it. And wives do, as they're told. And sometimes husbands try. They do try. A god? Why do they say that? What are they thinking of? How could he be a god? They must have been pretty desperate to imagine we'd fall for that one. Speaking as the granddaughter of a god. Well, he knew it was mere politics, and so was this. Of course it was. I suppose they thought we had so many gods, one more wouldn't matter. There's kind of logic in that. But we don't take our gods terribly seriously. Oh, we dedicate shrines and pay a grudging respect on feast days. And in return, rather like children, we expect a few sweets in return and then to be left alone. If only this one would leave me alone. That he won't. Through the colonnade I went, barefoot. The pavement was already hot, so I dipped my feet in the pool. And as I ran, my footsteps dried up and disappeared behind me. You'd never know anyone had been there. I wasn't expecting a crowd. I knew my husband was going to interview a prisoner brought in by the local authorities. Hurried through breakfast so he could get done and we could spend our weekend by the lake. When I saw the crowd, I stopped. I saw my husband step forward and have a few words with a young man. And that's when the spiders crawled. That's when my dream reared up and stared at me. I'd seen all this happen before. What had happened? My husband had stepped out into the courtyard and a young man had been pushed forward. That's all. I wanted to tell someone. I needed to give a warning. But who should I tell? What should I tell them? What did I understood? Nothing. And I still understood nothing, except there was an overpowering need to grasp hold of something, to catch it before it went. Does that make sense? I'm an idle woman. I've been pampered and indulged, and I've more money than is good for me. But I am not stupid. That sad, slight figure in a rather grubby robe had stepped pure out of my dream into such wickedness as stopped my breath. And I knew I must not be part of it. Pilot and that young man went inside. I started to follow them, but how could I do that? I couldn't go inside the judgment hall in front of all those people wearing that dreadful dress. It would have provoked an international incident. Well, you don't think I should have done that? A woman in my position, letting the side down. Instead, I scribbled a note. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I told him he must have nothing to do with this young man, that he'd swirled and tumbled through my dreams all night, and that he was innocent. He was innocent. What should I have done? What could I have done? I didn't know who I had dreamt of. I didn't know who the man was or where he'd come from. I didn't know anything about him. I thought that would be enough. I knew my husband's not trained in diplomacy, but he does listen. 
Poor dear, I expect he thought he did his best, but he needed me there, actually there beside him to prop him up. He's never defiant enough unless he can catch my eye, but I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. He couldn't have expected me to. I'd have been a laughing stock, the wife who interfered. I'd have forfeited. I couldn't stand up there in front of everyone, even knowing the man was innocent. It wasn't my place. I'd have lost all dignity. The servants would have heard about it, and the friends I'd so painstakingly cultivated. And all for what? Why should I look a fool for the sake of a silly dream? And I wasn't to blame after all. I didn't hand him over. I didn't trump up any charges. I didn't do anything. I will not be laughed at. There is a proper way to behave. Let it never be said that I forgot myself, that I don't know the protocol. I did what I could. And after all, perhaps it was all in my imagination. There was a slight earthquake later that afternoon. It cleared the air. So perhaps... But the agony of the dream comes leering at me still. Sucks my memory back into the hot orange desert of Judea. The man I never knew treads through every thought, waking or sleeping. The sun won't dry his footprints. Listen to that pond. I'm so cold. <laughs> 